Teddy, it's great to be with you. Thank you again to our cooks. Janet is not here, so. Well, yeah, she is the cook and, and the chief bottle washer. And I'm just very, very fortunate to have her. So thank her for that. Hey, we're continuing. We're in chapter 23 today. And if you've read the chapter, it's kind of this blah of Jesus and stuff. Chapter 24 is like that too. It just takes all these stories and it just compresses them into one. So we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at, at just what, so one of the themes that I pulled out of it that I thought was kind of kind of interesting. But with the next few weeks, we're coming down to the to the end here, but we're looking at the life of Jesus as he is running through Judea and attracting attention and letting God's people know that he is real. And he hasn't really broken out of his own little group yet, but he's about to. So we see that we see our video tonight on setting the stage. There was a man called John the Baptist, who was actually the cousin of Jesus, who lived in the wilderness telling people to turn away from their own ways and live in God's ways. John's clothes were made from camels and he ate locusts and wild honey. People from all over the area came to hear John speak. He would often baptize those who decided to follow God, dunking in their lake as a symbol of their choice. One day, Jesus came to John and asked him to be baptized. John said, I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. But Jesus convinced him to baptize him. When he did, he saw the sky split open and the Spirit of God flew down like a dove and landed on Jesus. Then he heard a voice from heaven say, This is my son whom I love. After Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist told all who came to hear him that Jesus was God's chosen one, the Messiah. Then Jesus went out into the wilderness and withheld from eating or drinking for 40 days. There, the devil showed up and put Jesus through a series of tests. Despite the devil's efforts to get Jesus to stop trusting God, Jesus refused the temptation and the devil left. When Jesus returned from the wilderness, he selected 12 men to join him to minister throughout the area. These men, who were called disciples, became his closest group of followers. One day, when Jesus and his followers were attending a wedding feast, they ran out of wine. Jesus asked the servants to fill six large stone jars with water. When they did, the water miraculously turned into wine. This was just the first of many miracles that Jesus performed, showing his power and causing many to follow him. Jesus continued to travel across the area, meeting with everyone from powerful religious teachers to the ordinary folks, telling them how they could live God's way and be saved from their sin. And the miracles continued. Jesus healed people with all kinds of illnesses, and even helped a paralyzed man walk again. He spoke about a new kingdom that was very different from anything people had heard before. Many people were amazed, but some of the religious leaders were angry and fearful as his following grew. Those are such great videos. There's a little bit of religious the theological bias in that that I just want to draw your attention to. How, how did John baptize people? He, he picked them up and he threw them in the water. <laughs> you don't do it that way. We don't. We don't do it that way. Yeah, we have. Uh, there, there's a bit of a of a debate about whether baptism is something that requires immersion or if we can do it as we had a number of other denominations there. Yeah, yeah right. There, there are there are Lutheran churches that have that, that have yeah that the floor opens and you uh, I don't know if it's in the floor open, but there are Lutheran churches that have baptismal fonts you can actually 
be dubbed in. And it's, it's just a point of, of, of disagreement that we can agree to disagree. The, the Greek uses a word to go down into the river. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a translation. Do you go down the banks of the, to the river and get sprinkled? Do you jump in the river? And, you know, immersion baptism is great. A really cool thing. I think it's really, it's wonderful. You, you, you die and then you come out and you, uh, and, and you have new life. So it's symbolic. They really have fun. But it's really not required. The other piece, and I talked about, about this in Bible study the other day, and people were surprised. There are a lot of Christians who would look at your baptism, if you were baptized as an infant, as a, not a valid baptism. So if you left this church and you went to uh, Yosemite Church, I think you probably are Gateway. I, I won't speak for them, but I, I would presume a lot of Baptist churches. If you are not baptized as an adult, where you were involved in the process of, of affirming your baptism, then that baptism is not. You can't become a member unless you get rebaptized. Now, how, how many times does it say in Scripture we should be baptized? Once. It's pretty specific about that. But we can agree to disagree on that, too. So, <laughs> reason, to, reason to stay here. Speaking of baptism, I, I just wanted to, uh, to highlight something that I found interesting in this. That when we read this chapter, there were three instances that talk about the importance of water. The first is the baptism of Jesus. The second is the, the event in Cana at the wedding, where he turns water to wine. And the third is uh, a conversation he has with, with Nicodemus who is a member of the, uh, the ruling council, talking about um, people being born, you need to be born of water and spirit. And I just want to take a, just a couple minutes and just highlight something that I think has been kind of easy to, to miss, God's use of water in scripture. Water is mentioned over 700 times. And there are a couple of themes that it seems to, to revolve around. The first is birth. Birth of life. We see it in Genesis. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures. So it's, it's life comes out of the water. That's the first life we see. John 3, 1. Jesus talking to Nicodemus. I tell you the truth, no one can, can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again of water and of spirit. And then Ezekiel, there's... Uh, Ezekiel had a lot of discussion about water flowing out of the temple, the temple of, of the, the new heavens and the new earth. So life, new life, is associated with water. God's word is associated with water. And it is symbolized, water symbolizes it throughout a lot of places in, in Psalms and in Scripture. Um, Isaiah 55, this is, this is a pastor's favorite passage, Isaiah 55. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower, so my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose I have sent for it. So, which essentially says, if you preach the word, even though your sermon may really stink, God will do something good with it. That's always heartening for us. But he talked about the rain and the snow, but using that as an analogy. Hose. That goes along with not every sermon is meant for everybody in the church, and so everybody's going to have a different yeah. take on it, and it may only be directed really to one person in the church, even though you don't know. Yeah, and I, I, agree. I so appreciate you saying that, Ken, because I will, I will sometimes really struggle with, with a sermon, and I, you know, it'll be like 11 o'clock at night, and I'm, going, I'm just like, I'm so embarrassed, I have to show up tomorrow, they're going to hate me. And I, you know, I give my sermon and I give it my best. And I'm just sort of, and, and a dozen of you will say, hey, that was a great day. I really liked it. And I'm like, really? Don't you know that it really sucked? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just, I threw that because God just will work through his word. The only ones I have a problem with are the ones that I feel like you're spying on me. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I think you give you a lot of material with that camera that I've hidden in your house. That's what's really cool. <laughs> Hosea 6 says, uh, He will come to us like winter rains, like spring rains that water the earth. And Amos says, Let justice roll on like a river, righteous like never floating stream. So God's word is, is we, he uses the word water to, uh, to represent his word. Purification and cleansing of certainly baptism is, is a, is that the word baptize in, in Greek means to wash. You can go home, baptize the dishes. <laughs> that's, where, that's where Jan is right now. No, she was her call. Okay, well, she will. There's another word for that. But yeah, that, that's, that's, I mean, that's what we do. That the word baptizo is, is wash, just wash, just mean wash. It's a really pedestrian word. Ezekiel, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all impurities and from your idols. Hebrews 10, we are sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And then, of course, the Genesis passage where God floods the earth. Well, what is that about? He is, he, you know, God is really frustrated with the way the earth is is rolling out, and he he's, he destroys all but those who are on the ark with Noah, and he cleanses the earth so we can start over again. So we see purification and cleansing as part of it, and we see deliverance and rescue. Certainly, the Exodus. You know, we see God parting the Red Sea and and uh, and the Israelites escaping, and then we see um, we see them wandering through the desert. And, and desperate for water. A million, four million people, something like that, looking for water out the middle of you know, nowhere. And he tells Moses to strike the rock, and he provides sustenance um, and his, uh, his rescue from that. And then lastly, the, the blessings. The miracle of Cana, turning water to wine to, to keep the wedding going. John 9, uh, Jesus walking along saw a blind man at birth. He spat on the ground, made mud with his saliva, put it on the man's eyes, and said, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man went and he came home seeing. What is that about? It's just one of those weird God stories, actually. We really don't know. But he used water to, do, to, to create a blessing. And this in Isaiah 44, this is what the Lord says, I will pour water on a thirsty man and streams on dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. So water is, is an important part of our history and how God relates to his people. Just as I began thinking about this, I just pulled up some facts and statistics about water that we deal with. Uh, 97, almost 98 percent of the water in the world is in the oceans, and therefore you know, not not potable. And of that two and a half percent, look at this: two thirds of that that's left over is in you know Greenland and Antarctica. A, a third of it's underground, and then just a fraction is in little lakes here. And isn't that isn't that sobering? And when you look at this next picture you see physically how big a rock earth is with just this drop on it, most of all, with, which is the oceans, which is not, again, not, not potable. Water is a very precious commodity. We're, we're seeing this in Cape Town now, aren't we? Where is going, what's going on in Cape Town? I think it's July 15th is their deadline. Unless something remarkable happens, there are going to be water stations throughout Cape Town. I think there are four million people in Cape Town. Correct me if I'm wrong. Stuart, you know this. You know everything. So. <laughs> of course. There's a ton of people in Cape Town, and they're going to be they're going to be given I think 50 liters of water a day, which is you know we we do that warming up the water so we can brush our teeth with warm water. It's just we have they're going to run out of water entirely. And boy, you know we we got some issues here in California. But, uh, but we are blessed. We do have water. And I, I just, uh, I think that water is one of those things that we take for granted, that God has blessed us with, that he uses 
in so many ways to continue to bless us, and that we as Christians need to be stewards, caretakers of this thing that we take for granted. And it's something that's so often spoken of in, in Scripture. Any, any thoughts on that? When I read on Cape Town, many of the populace did bother, they were told to cut back on water use. And they didn't bother. And he didn't. They didn't bother. No. That was part of the issue. The larger part of the issue is, you know, there just is a lack of water. But they didn't believe that, you know, they didn't believe that it was, I think it's pushed back in May, if I'm not incorrect. It was May, and then I think it's July now. Oh, it's July. Right. There's, a, there's a big positive reaction because of the fact that the stats started getting real. I'm not certain. That, you know, we were told to cut back, and I think last year we kind of did. But had we not, or two years ago, had it not rained 160 percent of last year, and we had 20 uh, percent, we didn't yeah. have it. I think, my boy, that, that's just scary. Yeah, and even when they lifted the drought off most of the state, Central Valley is still in the drought. Oh, really? Because of our water supply is groundwater, and so much of it has been depleted. Yes, that's another piece is, well, I hear these stories about groundwater, and I just, gosh, the stewardship of this planet that we're in. Mm -hmm. Isn't Tennessee the Valley a, technically a desert? Because of the, it has more, it has mm -hmm. more evaporation and precipitation, which would be, I mean, it's artificially, would. I want to say the word artificial. That's the wrong way. We we made it happen, right? But yeah, this is a this is a desert, and we've we've imported water to it. LA is a desert. Yeah, that's, they stole that's all the water. Yeah. <laughs> we stole all the water from Montreal. Yeah. 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 They kind of like they're building desalination plants and all sorts. It's insane what they're doing down there. I was going to be there at the uh, end of May. You're going to be there at the end of May. Bring your own water. I am, I am working with, I'm going to be Joe Berg in um, Cape Town, and I am, I told my uh, sales person that I'm, um, I want to be in Cape Town at the least amount of time possible. That'd be, I'd be fascinated to hear this. This is not something tonight's on the time for it, but we, 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 need, we need to dig into a little bit of, of what it means to be stewards of this earth, and what is Chris, the Christian responsibility. There are a lot of Christians who live in the, in, in the Genesis passage that says, I will, man and Adam and Eve, I will give you this earth and you will, the word is subdue, English word is subdue, which means you know, just destroy it, do it, whatever you want with it. And, and that, that unfortunate interpretation has resulted in a lot of, a lot of Christians feeling like we have the right to just kind of do what we want with it. And I think we need to examine, is that, is that a fair interpretation? Is that a fair understanding? And, and what, is our, what, what is our responsibility? What is our stewardship? What is our role for this earth? Yeah? I'd love to hear more information, too, on the desalinization that he was talking about. Because some, some nations have started, um, I can't remember off the top of my head which ones have, but we have a lot of ocean water. If we don't destroy the ocean water by just, you know, by taking the salt out, if we can live together, it will save you. Yeah, the problem with desalination, as power we can address, is, is yeah. electricity that takes yeah. to do it. It takes a huge amount of power, so yeah. burn all these coal plants to fill the air with <laughs> so we can have water. There's, there's a certain balance that we have. Whenever you go on a cruise ship, they have desalination. They get the seawater and process it for, to go throughout the ship. For the toilets and things like that. Right. Help with the drinking water. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, uh, we'll delve into this. We should do a lecture on this. But what is, uh, I think we need to look at, as followers of, of Jesus, what is, what is our vocation as residents of this earth? What does that mean? So uh, let's talk, let's listen to what Randy Frazier has. This is your story. This is my story. But most of all, this is the greatest story ever told. This is Dad's story. Mm -hmm. 
Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened in Bethany on the other side of Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Major downtown areas wouldn't be the same without street vendors, cabs, a few beggars, and the street preacher. These street preachers aren't your average Reverend Joes. Some are even a bit scary, and you wonder if they've forgotten to take their meds. But nonetheless, they are standing on the street corner, proclaiming that God has a solution to people's eternal problem. So what's the solution? What's the plan of God to get us back? We've been seeing it unfold for over 2,000 years through Israel. Well, we're told by Malachi at the end of the Old Testament that the next prophet to speak will introduce us to the solution. After 400 years of silence from God, the prophet emerges. His name, John the Baptist. But he's not your garden variety kind of preacher either, no. He is a scuffy, eccentric, bohemian guy who lives in the woods, has no credentials, and eats locusts and honey. I hope at least he puts the honey on the locusts to sweeten the taste of the mind. John the Baptist, like the street preacher, was just a little out there. But John, too, is committed to giving us the solution to our eternal problem. He is finally going to introduce us to God's solution to getting all of us back. John emerges from the wilderness, picking locust legs from his teeth, and he begins to speak. Heads turn. When the Jewish leaders ask him who he is, he replied, I am the voice of the one in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. They should have known immediately who he was claiming to be. This is exactly what the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Malachi said he would say. John is going to tell us that the solution is not a what, but a who. And we have to understand who he is before we can understand what he came to do. What he is going to do will only make the difference if he is who he says he is. The first time Jesus and John meet, Jesus asks John to baptize him. And John feels highly uncomfortable with this, but Jesus insists. When Jesus is baptized, heaven opens up and the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. Then a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Here we have the presence of the Godhead all in one major event. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The first to reveal the identity of Jesus is God himself. Jesus is no ordinary Joe. He is the Son of God. The Spirit then leads Jesus into the wilderness. He fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. He's hungry. When we are weak in our flesh, we are the most susceptible to cave in to temptation. And Satan takes advantage of this moment and tempts him with three very enticing things. Each time Jesus resists, and he responds by quoting scripture. This is a good reminder to show us to know the scripture, have it in our hearts, ready to respond when temptation comes our way. At the end, Jesus doesn't succumb to any temptations. Why? Because he is sinless. 
without blemish. Next we find Jesus once again approaching John. John shouts out, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The second day, John sees Jesus again and he says, Look, the Lamb of God. Now who is Jesus? John says he is the Lamb of God. No Jewish person could have misunderstood what John was saying. The young, unblemished, innocent Lamb of the Old Testament was the one whose life was given up and bloodshed to pay for sins. We saw this on the day of Passover in Egypt, where the blood of the Lamb was applied to the doorframe of every Jewish home. In the wilderness and in Canaan, a man would bring a lamb or a bull to the priest. He would place his hand on the head of the innocent animal, officially transferring all his sin and guilt to the animal. The priest would then slice the throat of the lamb or the bull, catching its blood in a bowl. That blood was placed on the altar for the forgiveness of sins. John is declaring that Jesus is the ultimate lamb, the lamb of God. Next we find Jesus at a wedding with his parents. They run out of wine. Ma Mary obviously knows who her son is and she puts the burden on him. Jesus, why don't you do something about this, she said. This might be taking a little advantage of the situation. Jesus says, why are you involving me in this, Mom? It's, it's not my time to go public yet. And yet Jesus turns the water into wine. And not just any wine, the best wine. The guests just thought the bridegroom had saved the best for last. Jesus' secret was safer now. But this is the first of many signs that he is the who we have been waiting for. Now the time had come for Jesus to reveal who he is. With his 12 disciples at hand, he begins to teach and heal people. Jesus instantly becomes the buzz everywhere he went. Some conclude he's the Messiah. Some are troubled by his claims. Next, Jesus, now in Jerusalem, has an unexpected visit at night from a Pharisee named Nicodemus. In this conversation, Jesus gives one of the clearest declaration of who he is and why he has come. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus is the Son of God, who came from the upper story to us to overcome the sting of death and offer us an eternal relationship with God for those who believe. We don't know how Nicodemus responded to Christ's conversation that night, but we do know that he helped a believer in Jesus, a gentleman by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, bury Jesus. I think he became born again. On Jesus' way back to Galilee, he decided to go through Samaria. Now, most Jews went out of their way to go around Samaria because they looked down on them as a people, but not Jesus. At noon, he, he comes to a well and he finds a woman. A conversation breaks out. Now, a Jewish man would never be caught dead having a conversation with a Samaritan, let alone a woman. Jesus did. All the rules are changing. Jesus sees into her heart and her life's history, and she knows instantly that he is not your average guy. She says, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. Jesus responded back, I the one speaking to you, I am he. Now she runs back into the town and gives her testimony, and we are told that many people believed. This good news, as promised first to Abraham, is not just for Israel. All nations will be blessed. God wants to give everyone a chance to come back to him. Well, momentum is building both to follow him and to kill him. He traveled in Galilee teaching and healing people of their diseases. On each occasion, he is providing proof that he is who he says he is. Interestingly, he also cast out demons in people, evil spirits taking up residence in people that oppress their lives with depression, rage, confusion, and illness. On several occasions, the demons would come out and they would totally recognize Jesus as God, but Jesus prevented the demons from speaking. But not everyone was buying it. On one occasion, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. He tells the man his sins are forgiven. 
Now the teachers of the law overheard this and said, He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They're right. But they don't see Jesus from Nazareth as God. This is why they remain unmoved at his death. This chapter ends where we began, with John the Baptist. And he's in prison. He sends word to Jesus asking this question. Are you the one who was to come, or should we be expecting someone else? John knew that he would likely be losing his life for his bold proclamation of the Messiah. He wanted to make sure he had the right guy. Understand? Jesus sends back an answer that would bring a final result to John. And not much later, as Jesus' popularity and opposition continue to rise, John is beheaded. He died knowing who Jesus is. God of the upper story entered into the lower story to provide the final solution to our grandest problem. His name is Jesus. Before you know what the solution is, you need to know who the solution is. What Jesus is going to do in the next three years from now, while heroic in the moment, doesn't matter for all eternity unless he is who he claimed to be, God himself wrapped in flesh. We are faced with the same decision as all those people who encountered Jesus when he walked on the earth. God the Father sent God the Son to us to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. God himself is the solution we have been waiting for all these years. Maybe we need to stop and listen the next time we walk past the street preacher. He might not be as crazy as we think. What jumped out at you? Anything jump out at you? Any, any question? Any aha moment? I was wondering if it was my imagination, but I thought I was hearing thunder in the background as he was talking. I heard this rumbling. Nobody else heard it? Okay. <laughs> 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 I don't know. He's in Dallas, so that's a distinct possibility. Yeah. Well, I just thought that was interesting. Thank you for that. Yes, I read. I was a little taken back that in prison that John doubted enough to ask Jesus, are you really the one? You know, that struck me too. I hear he's saying, I am the voice of the wilderness preparing. Is, are you really? I mean, it's like, why were you saying this if you weren't kind of like, yeah, yeah I thought that I was interesting. Reminds us all of us, sometimes we, we have doubt. We, sometimes we do have doubt. Sometimes, yeah, mm -hmm. and here even John the Baptist yeah. is unclear. He thinks he knows what he's doing, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. And thank you. And see, he saw the miracle of yeah. God speaking yeah. and everything, and so mm -hmm. and when we look at all these miracles that Jesus was doing, not everybody believed. Not yet. And so all these people, Mary and I were talking today, Mary and I were talking today about me. Not, not my thunder Mary, but Mary behind her. We were talking today about uh, uh, how, how people saw Jesus and hung out with him and then at one point stepped away. They, they, and so even, even people who are watching him, watching him do miracles, at some point had doubts. The story beyond that is that you're so influenced by the people around you mm -hmm. that even today that can happen because you can be so influenced by the people around you that that's what happened to him. Yeah, influenced by the people around us to the, uh, the, the denigration of, of God's influence. Boy. Yeah, so you figure it's been 2,000 years since Jesus was here. There are a lot of people that just aren't on his bus and they're going to influence us. I think for me, for one of the things Randy said is, you know, um, the little Trinity thing was when he said, it's God wrapped in the flesh. Mm -hmm. They kind of brought closer together that understanding for me. It was an aha moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God in the flesh, wrapped in the flesh. 
Yeah, that is a great phrase. God wrapped in the flesh. And we have to remember that it is only through Him that we're able to believe. So what I see is that we can believe. I've never heard a phrase like that before. Only through Him that we are able to believe. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that work in us that we are able to believe. Yeah, it's not by our own power or desire. It's not by our own just have enough faith by the power of the Holy Spirit that work in us. So we pray for the Holy Spirit to be work in those people who don't know Him. When you have someone maybe who is struggling with their faith for whatever reason, usually for good reason, they think God is just not giving them a yes, how would you guide them? You know, just to keep saying, oh, you've got to believe, you've got to pray more, and that doesn't seem to really help. I don't know if there's some other way. So what, so give me your question again. If someone is having a problem with their faith, they're mad at God because it's not answering their prayers. If they think that he's abandoned you. And so when your answer is you just got to let go and let God and you need to pray more, sometimes that doesn't work. They kind of get mad at you for saying that. So the question is, you know, somebody who's struggling with their faith, maybe they had some terrible, disappointing event in their life and they're, they're mad at God. I think one of the helpful questions that I have found is, you, okay, you, you, you're struggling, you, you, you don't believe, do you want to believe? If, they, if the answer is, yeah, I want to believe, you have faith. That is a statement of faith. I want to believe. I don't right now, I can't, I, I, no, you actually do. And they're angry, and they're they're hurt, they're frustrated, they're they're running away. What? And that's okay. God's got pretty broad shoulders. But I think when you when you ask somebody, do you want to believe? They have faith. When they say no, I think we just have to recognize, for whatever reason, the spirit is not going to work in them, and we need to be available and a witness of what we know and to be concerned for them and to live out our vocation as their friend, their partner, their, their neighbor, their, in their life. And we can, be, we can be a prayer where we can pray for them, but we cannot close the deal and sell them Christianity because we give them the, the right zinging phrase that, oh yeah, okay, I guess I'll become a Christian. That is not your job. Your job is to care about them, to pray for them, to be available, but it is not to make them a Christian. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. Press them. Okay. Prayers without action. Those you got to put feet. You got to put action to a prayer. You Sometimes pray, you put pray about something and just sit back. Uh, yeah, I think. I think. Okay. Good. Good point. So your neighbors. Not a believer, not a, I hate that term. Your, your, your neighbor is not connected to, to Christ, and and we just sit in our house and pray for them. Well, that's nice to do. Now, if your neighbor is two thousand miles away, maybe that's all we can do. But but then when you're out there putting your garbage out and they're putting their garbage out, and they never come out of their house, and then you make an effort to say, Hey, how are you? I haven't seen you for six months. Well, that, that's putting that's putting effort that's putting uh, feet to your well, to your prayer. Well, you want a job and you don't go out and look for one. You know, like yeah, okay. You want a, a magic wand? Okay, here's your job. Well, you have to learn. You have to put feet to your prayer. You know, it's not all about God just being, you know, touching you. It's going to be fine. I, I think. I mean, you can. But most prayer, people, prayer is our request to God. And we are encouraged to, so, so I can pray for my brother Andy, who's in, in Washington, D.C., who I see every, you know, six, 12 months, and I talk to him every few months, but, you know, I'm not in his life all the time, so there's only so much feet I can put to that. Uh, so I think we have to be, but God can still be active. God can still, God's going to still listen to those prayers. So, um, 
I, I think we, yeah, and I, I think that we have to get, be careful not to, uh, to, 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 to feel like we, we have got to be the, the bringers of, the, of heaven to, to, to this earth. We, we don't. God does. And, uh, Ken, the day? Well, sometimes the things we ask for, we don't think we're getting an answer, but sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, that's good. God's, God's answers are yes. And not now, and no, and that's, that's we got it. That's that's Petra. Petra's parents just decided they're not going to baptize her yet. Her, her, they, they've got theological reasons for that, and they you know, don't want to get in trouble that. But man, she is like the most, she asks me God questions every day, really intense ones. Sometimes I can't even answer them. And she said, you know, So I think the, the Holy Spirit is very clearly at work. Was she an adult? She'd be baptized tomorrow. It's not magic water. It's, yeah, and it's not magic water. Yeah, I think it's it's the spirit infused with water, and and, and it's is something we can hold on to. It's but it is not. To well, it's definitely okay, it's, it's it's it is God at work. It is God, and that's why we, that's why babies can be baptized because it is one hundred percent God at work. I mean, you, you hold on to it, you can affirm it, but it is entirely something that God does. We do not bring anything to baptism. But the thing is, is we can't bring people to faith. It's only through the Holy Spirit that they come to faith. That's right. And I think, I think that's just such a key understanding that gets lost in our, in our discussion. We cannot bring anybody to faith. This, that's why all, for these people that, that may say, you know, I don't, I don't really want to believe that's, you know, just not up for me. Okay, fine. But you, we are still the people in their lives who are there to be uh, witnesses of what we've experienced. And when the time is right, when the Spirit starts messing with them, when they have some crisis that they don't have an answer to, there we are. The neighbor who's, who's always been there and now is suddenly important. You don't know how strong the, the prayers of your neighbors might be in affecting what God brings into his life to make him more aware of his need for God. Yeah, the spirit, uh, spirit knows <laughs> where You hear stories all the time about people who are cold hearted pagans and then you know, something happens. You know, it's just... Well, you hear people all the time who have the basis of their faith through their life, growing up a little bit here, a little bit there. Oh, I don't believe in that stuff. And then all of a sudden something happens. The child gets sick or they lose their job or something. And immediately they hit their knees. So it's in there. That Holy Spirit is in there. And they just have to recognize, good Lord, I need it. I need the, the Holy Spirit. I need you. And then they change. They, they realize the value of their faith. Sometimes we have to hit our lowest point in order for our hearts to be open to accept. Yeah, we, we wonder what, what suffering, the suffering just seems so miserable. Well, that may be you know, what it takes for us to get on our knees. Stuart? Yeah, I think the other thing as well is that we're all wonderfully stubborn creatures. <laughs> and we rebel against being told what to do as a general rule. It's in our nature, unfortunately, right? We, we, we don't want to be told what to do by others, and I think sometimes um, preaching horizontally, I don't know what you're going to call it, sometimes it doesn't work because of that. It's not the actual message, it's not the words, it's just somebody doesn't want to be told. I, I, I thought about my sister in this regard. I think she, she's been here, and she'll be back in July, but like years, when my mom died in 2007, that really hit my sister hard. They were very close. I, well, I was close to my mom too, but her, the immediate reaction to that was the quite a, not an uncommon one, but that she did rebel and she didn't, well, she'd lost her faith and what have you. And um, I remember talking to her about it then, and she gave me the, the typical older sister response, which is basically to leave her alone on this topic. So I did, but every time I saw her, I'd go to church, I'd, I'd ask if I could take her kids and stuff like that. And um, it was like about two years ago, um, she just started talking and asking more questions. And that's, that's when it was the comeback. And it really wasn't anything I did at all. I just left it alone. But was, yeah. I suppose, was the witness or was the example, I suppose. But. 
that's a great story about just being in the wings and waiting for this, for people to come to their own place or the spirit to, to be active in them and then just be available. I think that's an example of a couple of things. Both what you're talking about and your sister, we, we, there are a lot of people out there who have this God stuff in them. They grew up in the church, they have exposure to the church, they're people of faith, they are people who, who've had faith, and for whatever reason, they don't now, or they don't think they, or they don't want to, and they're just not there. Those are people that I think we can particularly be impactful with, because, because that stuff is resident in them, and when the time is right, and they, they have something to come back to. But there is an increasingly larger part of the population who don't have that stuff in them. Mm -hmm. They are the products, and you've all heard this, and maybe some of you have done this, who have uh, of, of parents who have said, I'm going to let my child decide what they want to believe when they're old enough to believe it. So now they're old enough to believe it, and they believe in the flying spaghetti monster, or science, or NPR. Sunday morning, or, or nothing, because they just have, they just don't, and so, yeah, they just don't, so when we start talking about this stuff, they're like, yeah, that's weird, and it is weird, they just don't have a frame of reference, and that, that's a little, that, I think we just have to be cognizant that it's not just about reconnecting the lost Christian, or the angry Christian, or the, the disconnected Christian. We're talking about people who just have have very sometimes very weird faith understandings, you know, UFOs and and crystals and uh, uh, psychic phenomena and, or or just scientific web whatever I can prove you know, intellectually. Um, you know, there's a lot we go on with this. Scientology is my favorite. Yeah. Well, Scientology, yes. Oh my gosh, that's just so amazing. But I, I mean, more more importantly, I think that more more down to earth, um, we are seeing the development of new religions in this country, and I think feminism is exhibiting many of the characteristics of of, uh, of, of a religion. Uh, there there is there is sin. There's actually no forgiveness. Oftentimes, but the, the, we're, we're seeing the development of new religions because they have no basis in Christian religion to, to fall back on. So that, again, we just need to be the people who are in their lives who care about them. And when they hit that rock bottom, when they are in the midst of suffering, we have a message of hope for them. <laughs> I don't know how we got on that, but. Uh, what was Jesus' first public miracle? He touched the eyes of a man who was born blind. He healed a man from Galilee when he had leprosy. He turned water into wine. He gave the early disciples a huge catch of fish. Water into wine. According to Jesus' words to the woman at the wall, at the well, how will true worshipers worship? They will worship with loud voices and singing. They will worship in spirit and in truth. They will worship in hands lifted high in praise. They will worship in deeds of service to the poor. Spirit and truth. Yeah, we should unpack that sometime. What was Nicodemus' role when he came to meet Jesus in the night? He was one of the 12 disciples. He was a tax collector. He was a chief priest. He was a member of the high Jewish ruling council. He was uh, one of the elite of the town there. And what did Jesus say when the lame man was lowered by friends from the roof? Your sins are forgiven. I have never seen such faith in all of Israel. Your faith has made you well. Do you want to be healed? Your sins are forgiven. Yeah. And that's interesting. Um, now, what, what, what did he mean by that? Not that I've done any reading on this, but let's just unpack that for a minute. What, what do you mean by your sins are forgiven? That naughty thing you did, it's okay now. That would have been? He thought that God was punishing him for being, you know, for his sin. Okay, so 
And, and now he is, he is uh, he's healed, and now um, God's through punishing him. God does his thing. What, what is Jesus saying, though? So what are your sins? Those naughty things you've done. Those things that deserve punishment. What else? What's that? <laughs> yeah. Come, come to my office and we'll speak some time. Yeah, doubt of God. That's, uh, that's, that's, you know, here's, here's a man who's, who's lame. Is, is being lame God's plan for, for people? No. God's plan was that we would walk with him in the Garden of Eden and spend time. And here's a man who's lame, so where am I going? Sin is these problems. These problems is sin. Being lame is not the plan. So being forgiven means I have two metal knees now. Yay! Before I can well, that's a blessing there, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that he, he's now being free from his sins. One of his sins was he was, was lame or whatever he was. And uh, your sins are forgiven, are removed, are exchanged for my head. So you are healed. So there's a, not just a, your behavior is now an acceptable column, but actually you are changed physically. You have that removed from you. Right. I, I'm curious, and I don't think it was this situation, I think it was a different one, where they, uh, they asked Christ, why, do you, why did you say your sins are forgiven instead of just saying get up and walk? And he said, <coughs> they said, who, who sinned, the man or his parents? You know, who, who did the sin? That was a different uh, example. Yeah. But yeah. he was saying your sins are forgiven. You know, get up and forgive walk. He tells us that all the time. Yeah, get up and, yeah, your sins are forgiven, get up and walk. Um, yeah, and then getting to yours, he, 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 he the, the, the disciples say, who sinned, this man or, or his parents? Right. And Jesus says, neither. Yeah. He says, this guy's blind so that the Son of Man could be glorified in how he healed him. There's something that God has different purposes here. His sin was forgiven. He, he was healed. Sometimes illness is a purpose to, you know, can be used to bring people to God. Yeah, tra tragedy and suffering and, and you know, the, our, our culture has no place for that. You know, our, our culture, the, 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 the non-believer says suffering is, is unacceptable. And any God that would let people suffer is not a good God. Because we know it's good. He doesn't know it's good. We know it's good. And, and yet, God is the, the ultimate determiner of what is good and what is bad. Remember we ate from that tree so we were so we could know what's good and bad, but we got it wrong. God knows what's good and bad with that. So he, he lets he lets people suffer. And how many stories have you heard of people suffering? And in that suffering they they come to they get on their knees. They come they hear the story. Well isn't that due to the the fall, the original sin, that the Lord said there I mean in that perfect world before the sin, um, there was no disease or blindness or lame or Correct. people or whatever. Correct. So people who get sick or are blind or that's the uh, that's the result of sin in the world. Yes. <laughs> Four years of seminary. Yeah, and John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away people's, yeah, pe not people's suffering, not all the bad things that you did, the sin of the world, all the suffering and all the bad things you did, and all the broken arms and all the blindness and all that, all that stuff. He is here. He is the first of the new creation. He is the first of the new heaven and the, the new earth. He is the one who will be 
beginning of the restoration of the garden where we would have all that stuff. That good news? Oh, yeah. Well, let's see. What else? Uh, we have about three minutes here, right? What else, what else impressed you from this? What else? What other question uh, jumped out at, at, at anybody here? Yeah, he did. This whole Samaritan thing is very interesting because there's so many different pieces of it. And he didn't say, yeah, you, you know, he eventually she, she said, I don't have a husband. He said, yeah, you're right. You, you've had six men in your life. Holy Plato, this guy knows me. And he didn't say, now stop that. He, he just, he went, how did he dismiss it? What did he say? He said, he just left. He didn't say go and see the Lord or her. That he said to the gal, the adulterers. Yeah, he said he said that to the woman. Remember that woman had who excuse me, adultery and everybody's ready to stone her, and yeah. Jesus comes and and the okay, first one who said let's throw that everybody laughed, really ticked off at him. That was her. He told her to go and sit no more. Yeah, so so he. Why, why, why did he talk to the woman at the well? To show that he was here for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Yeah, he was not. He came for the Jews, and they just wouldn't listen to him. And so he stepped outside, which he, he was here for anyway, but this is one of the first, not the first time he stepped outside of the Jewish community. And the Samaritans were, of course, quasi-Jews. We talked about this a few weeks ago. They were they were the leftover people, and they drug everybody off to Assyria, and they had kind of Jewish background, but also pagan background, and they were they didn't they didn't worship in Jerusalem. They and, and the Jews hated them because they were Jew wannabes. They're kind of familiar with, uh, with the, um, the scriptures of Abraham. Yeah, yeah. They were kind of watering down the, the purity. Of Jesus didn't leave her. She left him when the disciples came back to him. She left her water jar, went back to town, and told the people uh, that she saw the Messiah. Yeah, I, I didn't think he said anything. He just kind of he probably freaked out and ran off. Yeah. Excited. What's that? She got very excited. She got, she got very excited. Yeah, well, she, yeah, she got very excited. Yeah, she got, yeah, she, she met the, met the first female preacher. <laughs> the first female preacher. We won't go there today. <laughs> Thank you. It is a joy and a pleasure to be able to, to, to chew on God's word together with you. And I thank you for sharpening me, making me dig into things. And I hope I can do the same for you and if we do it for each other. Let's share God's story. Yes, you may share that story before we leave.
May you be witnesses to his love and his amazing work in your life. Good night. Amen.